Okay, good morning everyone um, and a very warm welcome to uh, the 2017 London Investor Show. Uh, we're now in the eighth year of the show and this show is all about giving you the information and the tools uh, to reach your, your financial goals, whatever they may be. And it's a philosophy which we very much share at Fidelity Personal Investing. Uh, our mantra is to make good investing easy and, and because of that we're really very pleased to be uh, supporting the London Investor Show uh, this year. Now, making good investing easy, it sounds, uh, sounds simple, doesn't it? I'm sure you will agree though uh, that good investing is anything but easy today. The investing uh, backdrop is extremely uncertain. Um, and with that in mind, uh, I'm going to pose seven questions today hopefully provide uh, you with seven answers and, uh, and then in addition seven ways to play the themes which I'm going to highlight today. If you still have any questions afterwards, I'm sure you will, um, come and see us at our stand, uh, Fidelity Personal Investing at Stand B1, have a, have a coffee with us uh, and chat with my colleagues and, um, and we've got a prize, uh, you can get the chance to win an iPad Pro today and we'll be announcing the winner at, uh, at quarter past four this afternoon. So, if there's one question that's probably uh, front of mind today, uh, it is this. It certainly is, is for me. Are we close to a bull market peak? Um, and why would it not be front of mind? Uh, yesterday, I I'm sure I hardly need to tell you, was the 30th anniversary of the 1987 stock market crash. Uh, we had the storm at the weekend, we appear to have another one sweeping in. So history doesn't always repeat itself, uh, and let's hope it doesn't even rhyme this year either. Uh, it's eight and a half years since the equity market uh, phoenix began to rise from the ashes uh, after the financial crisis. Uh, that's a long bull market. Uh, in duration, it's only been exceeded by the 1990 to 2000 period. The scale of the rise has been impressive too. Uh, again, it's on a par with the 82 to 87 bull market and, and it's only actually been exceeded uh, by that 1990s bull market. So it's not an unreasonable uh, concern that we may be coming to the end of the track of this bull market. Um, so bear markets, there are three types of bear markets. Cyclical bear markets, usually caused by rising interest rates, uh, an impending recession, uh, event-driven bear markets, caused by wars, price shocks, by their very nature, of course, they're unpredictable. And there are structural bear markets. These are caused by imbalances in the system uh, and, and, and valuation bubbles. The, the dot-com, the post-dot-com uh, collapse uh, and, the, and the financial crisis bear market probably fall into that category. So, Recognizing the types of bear markets is one thing. Spotting the signs that they might be imminent I is altogether harder. So wh what are some of the signals? The length and scale of the preceding uh, bull phase, um, excessive valuations, a maturing of the profit cycle, and a tightening of monetary policy. These are just some of the, some of the signals. Unfortunately, on their own, each of these uh, signals uh, can often provide false positives, uh, and they are less than helpful when it comes to timing, uh, spotting the timing of the turn in the market. Putting some of the indicators together c can help, and I, and I uh, looked at some interesting work that Goldman Sachs had done on this uh, recently. Um, they, they used a number of indicators, unemployment, inflation, uh, bond yields, economic survey data, and valuations, and they put them all together to create what they called a bear market indicator, and this is what's shown uh, in this chart. So, clearly, the higher the, the, the line rises, the greater the possibility, the probability of a bear market uh, ensuing. The vertical lines uh, show periods when share prices actually did fall, so actual, actual bear markets. And as you can see, the, the correlation, the link, uh, is pretty good. Uh, that's the first thing to observe. The second thing to observe is that the line is pretty high at the moment. So, on the face of it, I'd say, and maybe this is obvious, a bear market is, is, is more likely uh, today than it was uh, uh, a few months or a few years ago. Obviously, the market's been rising. Why might it be different this time? Well, um, a couple of reasons, I think. Um, post the financial crisis, uh, 
banks' balance sheets have been massively strengthened, and I think that that probably reduces the chance of the structural bear market that I talked about. We also live in, a, in a, an environment of low inflation. That means that we live in an environment of low interest rates. Uh, and I think with inflation staying low, possibly, probably, interest rates can stay low. And I think that makes a cyclical bear market also less likely. An event-driven bear market, of course, is by its very nature unpredictable. So uh, I, I think that all makes sense. I'd add one other observation about this bull market. It's been a deeply unloved bull market. How many of you feel really confident uh, about the market outlook? Very few of you, I suspect. I, I, I know I don't. And, and the lack of euphoria, I think, is a, is, a, is a good sign. It's a sign that the market may continue to, to, to grind higher uh, for a while yet. OK, so that brings me to my second question. How much cash should I be holding at the moment in, in my portfolio? Uh, now, I've done a lot of thinking about cash over the summer, and, and indeed, I personally have raised uh, the cash uh, holdings in, in my portfolio. Uh, now, I've done this for a couple of reasons. First of all, because uh, I'm a great believer in Warren Buffett's adage about the importance of not losing money. Rule number one, don't lose money. Rule number two, don't forget rule number one. And after a period of pretty much unnatural calm in markets, I am preparing for more volatility. I don't know when it will come. I don't know what will trigger it. I don't know how serious it will be. But I don't believe that we can continue indefinitely with these super calm markets. We've been more than 300 days now without even a 5% correction in the market. There have only been a couple of periods longer than that in the, in the post-war era uh, where markets have stayed uh, that calm. That's the first reason. The second reason uh, to have a bit more cash to hand uh, is my desire to keep my powder dry. If the market does correct, um, the babies will be thrown out with the bathwater. The good companies will be hit just as much as the bad. And if I'm fully invested at the top of the market, then I can't take advantage of those opportunities. I just have to wait for the market to bottom out uh, and rise again. And that will be deeply frustrating. So cash is not popular at the moment for good reason. Uh, it offers a pretty pathetic return, as we know. Um, this chart here shows the dangers of holding a low-yielding asset over the long term. Because of the, uh, the power of compounding, um, the gap between the higher-yielding asset and the lower-yielding asset just gets wider and wider as time goes by. But in the short term, it's a price that I'm uh, happy to pay uh, for the, the reassurance, for the sleep-filled nights, and for keeping my uh, ammunition, uh, my powder dry, uh, in case uh, there is a correction. So, question number three, inflation. Is, uh, is the dragon stirring? Well, I mean, this would be a familiar question uh, to any of us who lived through the 70s and the 80s. Inflation, as we know, is bad news for savers and, and investors. I've talked about the power of compounding, what a boon it's been to equity investors over the years, but it works uh, in the other direction too. So a small additional return year after year can build up massive outperformance, but a small underperformance year after year after year uh, can lead to real erosion of, uh, of inflation-adjusted wealth. So the Barclays Equity Guilt uh, study um, looked at asset class returns, and it found that uh, £100 invested uh, in 1900 with income reinvested was worth, in cash, was worth £20,000 uh, by last year. £100 invested in gilts on the same basis was worth £36,000. £100 invested in equities with dividends reinvested over that period was worth £2.2 million. So being in the right asset class clearly matters a great deal. But what mattered more over the last 100 or so years actually was the impact uh, of inflation. So that £20,000 in cash uh, was worth just £250 in 1900 money. The £36,000 uh, in gilts was worth £450 in 1900 money. And even the £2.2 million in equities was actually only worth £28,000 after the effects of inflation taken into account. Inflation is a killer for savers and investors. So when the Fed and the Bank of England start to worry about inflation, uh, we, should, we should listen too. The rise in inflation this week to 3% 
it might be largely currency related, but I don't think we should be complacent. Inflation never looks like a problem until it's suddenly a big problem. And all of the periods of inflation in the 20th century were actually preceded by periods of relatively calm and benign inflationary uh, conditions. Now, inflation, a little bit of inflation is not bad for equity uh, investors. Um, valuation multiples can stay quite high if inflation is, is, is moderate, but above a certain level, say four or five percent, uh, shares hate inflation just as much uh, as they hate deflation. So question number four, does politics matter uh, anymore? Now, a year ago, if you'd asked me this question, I would have certainly said, yes, it matters a great deal. We were stuck between the EU referendum, the US presidential election. Um, politics seemed very important. Now, as we've gone through uh, this year, it's, it's started to seem a bit less important. Um, uh, although recently it started to seem quite important again. So it, so it, it comes and goes. Perhaps the biggest uh, geopolitical story uh, at the moment um, is actually having almost no impact on uh, markets, financial markets, rightly or wrongly. North Korea's nuclear uh, posturing uh, might have been expected to cast a long shadow uh, over the markets very close uh, to, to North Korea. Actually, it's, it's, it's had very little impact. In fact, the South Korean Kospi index has been positively correlated with, um, with North Korea's saber rattling. Um, and I think markets are looking at what's going on and they're making a judgment. They're saying, actually, uh, they think that this will be a storm in a teacup. Um, and, and if they're right, then South Korea is as well placed as anywhere to benefit from the, from the coordinated growth in the, in the global e economy. If they're wrong, of course, then probably the level of the Kospi is the uh, least important thing on our minds. Closer to home, um, uh, politics has been progressively uh, less significant through the year. Um, all the fears about the rise of the far right seem to peter out during, during the, the middle of the year. Uh, but then, of course, the Freedom Party in Austria uh, at the weekend took 26% uh, of the vote. Catalonia, um, who knows where that's going to end up. So it's beginning to become more important in Europe. Uh, on either side of the Atlantic, I think politics has mattered a great deal over the last year. Certainly here, um, uh, the Brexit vote, I think, continues to cast a long shadow. Uh, sentiment is weak. A lack of confidence is showing up in the data. Uh, companies are holding back on investing. Uh, consumers are holding back uh, on spending. Of course, the biggest impact of Brexit has actually been a positive one uh, because the fall in the pound has been a massive boost to uh, the exporters and overseas earners in, in the FTSE 100. Over on the other side of the Atlantic, um, Donald Trump's election was initially seen uh, very positively for the markets. Uh, investors focused on his spending plans, on tax reforms, uh, and the protectionist uh, agenda. After the initial excitement, I think people realized that things were going to be a bit harder for him to, to, to push through, and the market paused for breath. But recently, the most recent rally in the market has largely been about expectations for tax reforms. And just uh, in the last week, um, Stephen Mnuchin uh, warned that, uh, that if tax reforms were not enacted, uh, then the markets could be very vulnerable, coming back to my, to my first question. So yes, I think politics does matter a great deal. The trouble is, it's very difficult to know exactly how it will play out uh, in markets, because markets sometimes behave in quite unexpected ways. And here's an example of the, the unexpected ways they can behave. And this is my fifth question. What if markets um, go sideways? Now, generally, markets rise until uh, the, the mood uh, changes and they fall back again. They tend to overshoot uh, in both directions. Overexuberance swings to overpessimism and back again. But it's not always the case. Uh, and uh, this is a snapshot of the Dow Jones Index, uh, sort of broadly speaking in the 1970s. Um, and it shows that markets can move sideways for uh, an extended period of time. And I just wonder whether we might be uh, moving into one of those periods again. So why might markets go sideways? Well, well self-evidently, they will go sideways if there's no particular reason for them to rise and no particular reason for them to fall. So why might markets not rise? Well, because over the last eight and a half years, they've re-rated significantly. They're now quite expensive. Corporate profit margins are pretty high at the moment. And also, I think those corporate profits are likely to be under-increasing 
pressure, from rising wages, uh, and from disruptive challenge. Why might markets not fall from here? Well, I say markets have been re-rated, but they're not absurdly expensive. And when you compare them to the alternatives, um, you know, what are the alternatives? In a world in which everything looks pricey, uh, then maybe equities don't look that pricey. And also, I think companies are in pretty good health. Um, they've rebuilt their balance sheets. Uh, if prices in the market fall much further, then I think industry buyers will come in and start to see opportunities. So uh, I think there are good reasons why the markets could move sideways from here. Now, if they do move sideways, is that a problem for investors? Well, yes, it is a problem uh, if you invest in the market through passive funds, because by definition, uh, your money is going to do nothing. But it's not a problem uh, if you are a, a, an active investor, um, if you are looking for the winners and trying to uh, avoid the, uh, the, the, the losers. So we did some, some recent uh, uh, research on this, and we found that in a, in, a, in a sideways market in the UK a few years back, uh, we looked at the performance of, of shares. We found over the short run, uh, markets tend to not do very much. Just 3% of the companies we looked at rose by more than 75%. But over a three-year period, the number of shares rising by more than 75% rose to 30% of the, the companies that we were looking at. So, you know, if we do move into a sideways market, I don't think that's anything to fear. Um, if you uh, or your fund manager are actively looking for the winners uh, and avoiding the losers. So, um, if we're looking for the winners, where might we find them? Obviously, as I've described, there are winners and losers at the stock level, even in sideways markets. There are clearly sector winners and losers too. And if you look at the, the recent performance of the market, it has been really driven to a large degree by the rise and rise of the technology sector. So in the United States, the so-called FANG uh, stocks, um, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Google owner Alphabet, etc. Uh, and in China, Tencent and Alibaba, um, they've been responsible for a significant proportion of the overall market gains. Now, on the one hand, this is, this is a worrying sign because a narrowing of market breadth um, it, it's a pretty good sign uh, of, of the top of the market. It's one of the classic signs of the of top, of, top of the market. We saw it in the late 1990s, of course, with the dot-com bubble. Um, but I think the technology boom at this time is very different uh, in, in nature. Um, it, it's not really driven by over-optimism, um, as it was uh, 17 or 18 years ago. It's rather it's being driven by fear. Technology is in favor today because it's seen as one of the few areas of sustainable uh, growth in a low growth world. And, and that's why I think the technology focus of the market at the moment doesn't feel like a sign of market excess. Uh, it feels like a trend that could, could continue for some time. That said, however, the final phase of the market will be driven by the adoption of a new, new story. Uh, and what might that be? Well, I think contenders include virtual reality, artificial intelligence, driverless cars, um, nanotechnology. But I would say, caution, take care. The winners and losers from disruptive technologies are often one or two steps away uh, from the central story. So who would have predicted a few years ago that putting a, uh, a powerful computer in all of our pockets uh, would pose an existential threat to the hotel business, think Airbnb. Uh, all that, um, uh, the very notion of car ownership uh, would, be, uh, would be damaged by uh, a business like, like Uber. Uh, so just as the winners from the, from the California gold rush were the manufacturers of picks and shovels and blue jeans, then I think the beneficiaries of the new technologies, uh, which undoubtedly will change the world, um, are as yet unpredicted and, and unpredictable. Okay, so, question number six. Where does, uh, wh where in the world should, should we be investing in light of what I've been talking about? Well, um, the big stories matter, of course, and a rising tide will lift all boats, so being in the right sector uh, is important. Um, but as we've seen this year, geography also matters a great deal. Emerging markets have had a fantastic year. The US and the UK have, have, have diverged. Um, I recently completed my quarterly uh, investment outlook, 
uh, for Fidelity Personal Investing's customers. And in it, I set out my uh, views uh, of the outlook for all the main asset classes and, and geographical regions. And as the map here shows, um, I'm broadly neutral on the world's largest uh, market, the US. I think Wall Street remains uh, the, the most expensive market in the world. It has a worrying dependence on this narrowing uh, leadership of the technology sector. Uh, and I think there's just better value elsewhere in the world. Mo moving across the, uh, the Atlantic, I have very different views about the UK uh, and Europe. Um, here, I think the political outlook is really unhelpful. Um, investors have too much exposure uh, to, their, to their home market, and I think income remains the main attraction in the UK. Over in Europe, however, uh, the economic outlook is good, valuations are reasonable, uh, there are some great companies to invest in, and the central bank remains supportive and helpful. Europe, I think, remains one of the best places to invest at the moment. I'm also positive on the Asian uh, growth story. Um, I think that remains intact. China is back on investors' radars. Uh, Xi Jinping tightening his grip. Uh, the MSCI bringing uh, Shanghai's A shares into, uh, into its emerging market uh, indices. Uh, India is pricey, uh, but uh, it deserves its premium rating, I think. And finally, uh, Japan. Japan remains on my buy list. Growth is solid. Uh, corporate earnings are rising. Deflation looks to be beaten. Uh, the, the country's in, in, in good shape. Uh, Shinzo Abe uh, is almost certain to secure a third uh, uh, term on Sunday in the election, so the politics are pretty stable. And meanwhile, the Tokyo market is cheaper than the US uh, and, and pretty much in line with, uh, with Europe as well. So, putting this into practice. Deciding where to actually put your money on the basis of some of those uh, themes and trends that I've highlighted, uh, here are some of my thoughts. So, first, going back to my first question, if you're concerned that we may be approaching a market peak, then de-risking your portfolio is key. And the first way I would do that is to invest in a multi-asset fund. These are designed to smooth the ups and downs of different asset classes. Uh, I particularly like uh, the Fidelity um, multi-asset open range. There are five different risk options uh, that to, to suit your particular uh, risk appetite and, and your uh, temperament. So I've started with a Fidelity fund, but uh, we are an open architecture platform. We sell um, uh, more than 2,500 funds from more than 100 different uh, managers on our platform. Um, the second one, uh, the, the second question uh, relates to cash. As I say, I think a little bit of cash in your portfolio, absolutely key. Keep some of your powder dry. I think we are going to have more volatility in the, uh, in the weeks and months ahead. Some cash will be helpful. My third question was about inflation. If you're troubled about uh, inflation uh, returning, then the traditional hedge against rising prices is gold. Um, now, you can buy the metal itself, um, or you can buy a proxy for the metal in the form of, a, of an ETF. Our favoured way of playing uh, gold, however, is through an equity fund. Uh, the earnings of a, of, a, of a gold miner are geared to the price uh, of uh, bullion in a rising market. Profits will rise faster uh, than the gold price itself. And the, and the one we like, actually, is the Investec uh, Global Gold Fund. Question number four was about politics. Um, and if politics does matter and we continue to live in a, in a world of uncertainty, then I'm looking for the reassurance of the most stable contributor to total returns. Now, uh, as with commercial property, um, the total returns from the equity market are largely driven by income. Capital values go up and down, but income is steady and reliable through the cycle. Now, coupled with my preference for uh, Europe, uh, I like the look of uh, the Invesco Perpetual European uh, Equity Income Fund run by Stephanie Butcher, uh, a, a very good fund. My fifth question was about sideways markets. What happens if markets do move sideways? If markets do move sideways, as I said, you need to be focused on active management. You need a pure stock-picking fund. The one I've chosen uh, is the Fidelity Global Special Situations Fund. It's run by Jeremy Podger. Um, uh, it also has an exposure to Japan, which, as I said, is one of my favoured markets at the moment. Sixth, 
What's the next big thing? Well, um, another global fund that I've liked for quite some time is run by a guy called James Thompson, uh, Rathbones. It's the Rathbone Global Opportunities Fund. It's an out-and-out -out growth fund. Uh, it has a technology bias, um, and it's delivered excellent performance uh, over the years. And finally, um, uh, as I say, I'm keen on the Asia-Pacific region at the moment, uh, and my fund of choice here is the Old Mutual Asia-Pacific Fund. It's run by Ian Heslop. Um, uh, a very quantitative approach. It's exposed to uh, the developed markets, uh, Hong Kong, uh, Singapore, Australia, as well as the emerging markets uh, like China. So there we are, seven questions, uh, seven sort of answers, and uh, seven ways to play the themes. Um, please note that they're not personal recommendations. I don't know anything about your personal circumstances. Um, these are investments that I like the look of myself. Uh, if in doubt, take advice. If you'd like to hear more about these funds or indeed about Fidelity's uh, service, then please do uh, drop by our stand. Um, you'll find there a copy of uh, my latest investment outlook, which I mentioned. Uh, you'll also find information about our Select 50 list of our preferred funds. Most of the recommendations I made here are from our Select 50 uh, list. And if you're looking uh, to invest with Fidelity, we have a cashback offer uh, running at the moment. So ask our relationship managers for details uh, about that. And don't forget our competition to win an iPad Pro. You'll find an entry card on your seats, um, or you can collect one from our stand. Uh, thank you very much for your time today. And uh, with that, I will hand you over to Justin, I think. Thank you very much.